we'll give uh, everyone a moment to join, and then we'll uh, dive in. I'm uh, for those of us, uh, and I'll start sharing the PDF on screen as well. Uh, we are in the middle of page uh, 103. Uh, at the paragraph that starts books like those are nauseating. We will do a continued reading of all of this uh, and we'll continue to move. And then at some point I expect us to finish and we will simply begin a larger discussion around everything uh, that is section 2.5. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, excitedly dive into all of it. Uh, so as always, uh, Thank you very much for joining us today on the Delusing Watery Quarantine Collective. Uh, we are continuing our reading of Anti-Oedipus, now the second time around. We're in uh, section five of chapter two, uh, as we go through the conjunctive synthesis of consumption consummation, uh, which essentially is actually just a very long section explaining all the broken parts of uh, things that came before, especially Oedipus, which we're both mostly going to be shitting on for the next 20 minutes and then having a larger discussion around. Uh, as always, you can find us on Twitter at D and G Q C uh, Patreon. If you're willing to support every dollar helps us break even uh, D G Q C on Patreon and uh, our YouTube channel as well. For those of you who care about such a thing, um, <clears throat> So uh, with that, I think uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll dive in. Any last uh, notes, any big things, any stuff going on that uh, we should be chatting about before I dive in? Um, I, I do have one. I've got to hop out after this. But um, um, I just wanted to say, uh, as we're going through this and we're talking about consummation and consumption and subjectivity, um, syllogistically and paralogistically. Uh, I, I want to make a comment following up on last week, we talked about like different social issues, but particularly things like race, gender, uh, sexuality, and the way that Oedipus interacts with them. I just wanted to kind of restate this as we're going through this, that um, it's not necessary that Oedipus effaces all that, right? There's not necessarily a sense of true erasure there in the sense of like obliteration, right? What's kind of interesting about how they're laying out this paralogism, and especially when they get into S1, but even with the Fanon example, right? There's a way in which race and um, these other affects are still kind of present. But when we deal with them paralogistically and in terms of like subjectivity and their intensities, something really interesting is happening to them, right? that that Fanon example gives us something to pause and reflect on. So as we go through this and, and we kind of finish up this section and move into these uh, paralogisms more directly next week, it's something to think about um, and have in mind is what does happen to these effects, right? How does Oedipus engage race, um, things like race or sexuality, but also has that is delusion water, right? How does it displace those effects? Cool. That was the last bit I had. Oedipus uh, displaces, but also integrates them. Um, that's a fantastic preview of how the rest of the section plays out. So thank you very much, Jack. Um, but with that, I think I'll uh, go ahead and uh, begin diving in. And uh, again, we are middle of uh, 103. Uh, we have just finished, uh, just a short recap because it's worth it. We have just finished uh, discussing sort of the history books that talk about all of the different realities of Oedipalization of uh, history and historic peoples from Hitler to the German people, to Luther, to God, to Christian, to 16th century church, whatever it may be, uh, playing with the idea that all of this is because these people were not properly Oedipalized, sort of rebuilding the past of history. Um, so with that, I'll continue on. Books like these are nauseating. Let's not dismiss them by saying that they belong to the distant past of psychoanalysis. Similar books, a lot of them, are still written today. Let's not say that it is merely a question of a careless use of Oedipus. What other use could be made of Oedipus? Nor is it a case of an ambiguous dimension of applied psychoanalysis. For all Oedipus, Oedipus in and of itself, is already an application in the strictest sense of the word. And when the best psychoanalysts forbid themselves historical-political applications, 
We can't say things are much better, since the analysts' retreat to the rock of castration presented at the locus of an intendable truth that is irreducible. They closet themselves in a phallocentrism that leads them to think of the analytic activity as always having to evolve within a familial microcosm. And they continue to treat the libido's direct investments of the social field as simply imaginary dependencies on Oedipus, where it becomes necessary to denounce a fusional dream, a fantasy of a return to oneness. Castration, they say, is what separates us from politics. It's what makes for our originality as analysts. We who do not forget that society, too, is triangular and symbolic. Uh, very simple paragraph. I, I, I'm very tempted to just simply dive directly into the next uh, group. Uh, it, again, uh, discussing about how all of this is sort of rewrapped, and everyone's so very, very excited to bring things into Oedipus and that everything ultimately becomes triangulated. Uh, they are about to do the takedown on this, but uh, if anyone has any comments, I'd love to hear. Yeah, it's it's webcam parrot says it's it's one of those rare times where it's like, oh, cool, this is fairly self-explanatory. Not a lot of times we can say that in this book, but sometimes it does happen. Uh, does anyone have questions here? Anything they're referring to? Because it's pretty cleanly uh, stated. But don't feel bad if you don't get it. I want to answer those questions. All right. Well, then I'll move on to the next paragraph so we can get into something that isn't quite as clear. Uh, if it is true that Oedipus is obtained by reduction or application, it presupposes in itself a certain kind of libidinal investment of the social field, of the production and the formation of this field. There is no more an individual Oedipus than there is an individual fantasy. Oedipus is a means of integration into a group, in both the adaptive form of its own reproduction that makes it pass from one generation to the next, and in its unadapted neurotic stases that block desire at prearranged impasses. Oedipus also flourishes in subjugated groups, where an established order is invested through the group's own repressive forms, and it is not the forms of the subjugated group that depend on Oedipal production, projections and identifications, but the reverse. It is Oedipal applications that depend on the determinations of the subjugated group as an aggregate of departure and on their libidinal investment. From the age of 13, I have worked hard, rising on the social ladder, getting promotions, being a part of the exploiters. There is, therefore, a segregative use of the conjunctive syntheses of the unconscious, a use that does not coincide with divisions between classes, although it is an incomparable weapon in the service of a dominating class. It is this use that brings about the feeling of indeed being one of us, of being part of a superior race threatened by enemies from the outside. Thus, the little white pioneer's son, the Irish Protestant who commemorates the victory of his ancestors, and the fascist who belongs to the master race. Take this down bit by bit, uh, less obvious of a passage this time around. Um, as we've talked about before, and as they've talked about sort of throughout the first section, and they will continue to, the reality is that something like this doesn't exist on a purely individual level. Uh, their argument is that we have these large-scale groups. Oedipus works basically by playing with social norms and talking about such things. Uh, we need you to be Oedipalized so you integrate into society. At that point, you're actually talking about something that is part of that social fantasy, as they say here. Because it is part of that large-scale social fantasy, and because of how it's able to replicate, as they say, from one generation to the next, and within uh, the unadapted neurotic stases that block desire, it flourishes specifically within subjugated groups, where an established order is invested through the group's own repressive forms. The ability for people to be literally invested, having their own desires invested, thanks to the Oedipal applications in the things that are happening. The, Example they use is not something we don't hear now, even. Uh, it sounds straight out of right-wing YouTube. Uh, I've always worked hard. I rose the social ladder. I did this. Getting promotions. I've been part of the exploiting class. I am part of the group that is being, that is that is the elite. Um, we see that a lot now. Um, and because of that sort of nature of Oedipus splitting things up, they, they talk about it here as the segregative use of the conjunctive syntheses of the unconscious. Remember, uh, there's a lot of ways to use the 
uh, conjunctive syntheses, but the segregative use as I split off and I separate myself from others, as I create my own subjectivity, as I uh, sort of spot myself and play with such things, even saying I, to be frank, uh, is a pretty serious challenge. And uh, such a thing allows us to pretend that we are one of us or that I have fixed myself for the larger class that is in sort of large scale social power ruling the hegemony. This is my interpretation of how they're talking about it here. Uh, very open though. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way of looking at it. I, I think something else um, maybe worth pointing out here is that sometimes I, I see people sort of come in on anti Oedipus and they're like, oh, it's just a polemic against Oedipus. And it's like, okay, yes. But I think more importantly, and, and what they're sort of affirming here is that Oedipus is an example of a specific problem, of a specific way of doing things, of triangulating things, you know, pushing things into certain boundaries. And then we can apply this like same specific criticism of the example of Oedipus to other systems like that. And they're doing that here when they're talking about, you know, the person sort of integrating themselves into, into society in a certain way because of Oedipus and things. Uh, Rimke asks, uh, does the segregative use of the syntheses then only happen in relation to Oedipus, or is it always a result of the synthesis and Oedipus is later related to it? Uh, so the, the answer to both is no. I think the answer is a little bit more uh, uh, complex than that. Uh, segregative isn't a thing that is determinative uh, within the third synthesis. The third synthesis being that of uh, the conjunctive, uh, sort of just say it again, sort of what the conjunctive synthesis is. Uh, the after effect of the way that the first two syntheses, which is connection and disconnection, uh, basically production and recording, production and recording happening back and forth. Afterwards, uh, the interplay of this uh, setup sort of produces intense experiences, produces intense sensations. And after that happens, the subject, I, or you, Rimke, for example, uh, we sort of realize this. We consume them after the fact, and we say, oh, that's me. That's how I feel about a thing. This is how I feel. I, I did this. The, the way that Oedipus and other uh, – we'll talk, they, they talk a great deal more about this, but this is less about Oedipus directly. Oedipus is, I think, a symptom of this. But uh, they're talking about the way that representation – at a large scale works uh, within the unconscious, specifically within Oedipus. Uh, the way that it, it functions is it plays us into a place where the only thing I have to sort of understand myself is a bifurcation. I'm either like mommy or like daddy. That's it. There's no sort of, you know, maybe unc daddy, mommy, uncle, uh, the example they use, uh, the uncle who's out for war, the unemployed aunt, the, the cousin, the neighbor, like, the, there's this large tapestry of people, but Oedipus literally says that, boom, it's everything has to be one of those two. And you start at this point separating not only those around you into one of two and having sort of everyone represent mommy or daddy, but because this sort of nature impinges upon you, suddenly you start segregating everything and you start playing into the place of, uh, I am this race, I am with this group, I am Oedipalized, I am not Oedipalized, uh, the sort of nightmare that sort of comes with that. So it's not necessarily only in relation to Oedipus. Oedipus is a brutal uh, version of it and a really good one that we still suffer from today, despite people not saying it explicitly. But uh, Oedipus is just one of many types of representations that do such things. Uh, uh, Oedipus is a phenomenal example of it. Uh, they're going to get a, a great deal more into representation, how it functions in capital chapter three, uh, which is going to take us a lot more than three <laughs> readings to get through a few of those sections. Um, but uh, that's, this is how uh, uh, they talk about it. They talk about it a few times and also how uh, Guattari talks about it afterwards in a handful of texts. Um, is that, is that close? Uh, any edges to that, that we should be adding any thoughts, secondary thoughts, anyone? Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I had a little question about um, the um, reduction to Oedipus. Is it something from guitar, um, from Deleuze and Guattari, or are they taking that from from Freud and Lacan? 
So the, the way that Oedipus functions in classic psychoanalysis is that Oedipus is determinate. Uh, everyone who is a human uh, has uh, has to place themselves properly within the Oedipal triangle. Uh, let's as they talked a little bit ago, and it's really the first section of this, uh, which would be worth going back and reading first section of this chapter, uh, Freud kind of fell backwards when he, he started talking about, uh, well, it's I'm noticing that these people have these feelings towards their dad and then towards their mom. It must be that they don't have healthy relationships. People who have healthy relationships with their mom and their dad like this, and let me define what healthy means, tend to come out very nice and productive on the other side uh, as a as an idea. What, where that started spurning and where it really spun off, I don't even know if people... I've, I've heard people argue that Freud didn't even necessarily believe in the Oedipus complex and that it kind of was this, this you know, monster that got away from them. So, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, my question was more specifically about the idea of reduction. So basically, um, uh, the idea of redu reduction to Oedipus is like bringing um, everything back to Oedipus, right? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not following. Does someone else uh, understand better? Because I, I'm not following the question. I'm sorry. Within the boundaries of, of uh, Oedipus, yeah. You might use the term like colored by Oedipus instead or something, you know. Okay. Yeah, because actually the, the French word is even more confusing to me. And um, But actually mm. reduction makes more sense uh, now I've, I've um, spotted it. Um, but even what you said also uh, helps too. Thank you. You could say it's like a bias or, or something. It is a reduction, but it's, yeah, that's like not clear what they necessarily mean. Yeah, in French, in French, they use rabattement, which is uh, like bringing back to. Interesting. They use a lot of that folding talk inside of this. Interesting. Um, yeah, we'll speak about folding uh, at the end because I'm still a bit confused. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, to continue to the next paragraph, um, Oedipus depends on this sort of nationalistic, religious, racist sentiment and not the reverse. It is not the father who is projected onto the boss, but the boss who is applied to the father, either in order to tell us, you will not surpass your father or you will surpass him to find our forefathers. Lacan has not demonstrated in a profound way the link between Oedipus and segregation. Uh, Lacan has demonstrated in a profound way the link between Oedipus and segregation. Not, however, in the sense where segregation would be a consequence of Oedipus, subjacent to the fraternity of the brothers once the father is dead. On the contrary, the segregative use is a precondition of Oedipus, to the extent that the social field is not reduced to the familial tie, except by presupposing an enormous archaism, an incarnation of the race in person or in spirit. Yes, I am one of you. One moment, I'm going to try to find, I had a note and I can't find the page yet on uh, the Lacan use of Oedipus and segregation. Ken, uh, I think you're here. Uh, do you have any reference to Lacan segregation or do I need to go looking? Yeah, you'll probably have to go looking. I'm not sure. I don't know where he uses segregation. Um, but while, while you look, uh, you know, I think it. I think the important, uh, an important distinction here is that you know not all boundaries are bad. It's sort of having your boundary making faculty usurped by some sort of dictatorial will. What you are is presupposed and pre predetermined. So, like any sort of uh, disturbance, all relates back to Oedipus. You know. If I have some sort of psychotic break because like three of my family members die and then I get cancer and, you know, I lose my house or something, um, that, that somehow that that would relate back to Oedipus is like this sort of asinine um, triangulation and, and presupposing of what structures your subjectivity. And this, uh, the Lacan line goes back, and it's the same one. I've, I've linked to this a couple times. It's one of my favorites. I'm posting it in the chat. It's uh, 
Uh, once again, the conversation between the patient uh, that Lacan brought brings up, uh, who talks about his father, who saw the uh, uh, the uh, transvestite prostitutes. Uh, it's a term they use. Um, and the father was angry and hateful towards them. Those guys should all be killed, um, saying awful things. The patient uh, really had his feelings of his father ruined over such a thing. Uh, the quote goes, there are many references in Lacan, mostly during the 70s, where segregation is linked to power struggle, uh, to history, to capitalist pseudo-discourse, and to science. However, in Seminar 18, Lacan claims, quote, it should be said there is no need for ideology for racism to be constituted. All that is needed is a surplus jouissance that is recognized as such. Uh, we can see from this quote that beyond any identification, beyond any imaginary tension, any logic of mass culture or historical factors, Lacan refers to jouissance as that which is at the heart of the matter of segregation. Uh, we clearly understand that what is usually denied is the jouissance of the other, but this is not the most interesting part. It is here we can retroactively think of the scope of another of his ecrits, one from his early teaching, going back 20 years in his work to the point during his research on paranoia, Lacan states, quote, When he attempts to show that it is precisely the cacon of his own being that the madman tries to get in at the get at in the object he strikes. Uh, here, in fact, we see the seed of all segregation, since it is one's own jouissance that remains misrecognized. It is when something of this jouissance returns from the other that the most fundamental denial sets into drive emotion in order to attack it. Uh, even though psychoanalysts may describe, uh, subscribe to movements that make fundamental rights into consideration, and I think it's desirable they do, they will always have on the horizon the limits of what is at stake at this level. There is a real hatred of extremism and fanaticism at the root of segregation. This real can only be treated on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account the subjective logic of the individual who professes it. Even so, if psychoanalysis can open up a question about this, it would be a valuable contribution to the world. It's a wonderful little note on sort of the nature where hate comes from. Uh, to bring that back to this paragraph, uh, Lacan's concept of the fraternity of brothers and uh, talking about sort of how society at once works when the father is dead, uh, this is not necessarily where it comes from. As they say, the segregative use is a precondition of Oedipus uh, to the extent that social field is not reduced to the familial tie except by presupposing an enormous archaism, an incarnation of the race in person or in spirit. Yes, I am one of you. The the ability to sort of reinforce that precondition is the nature of what Oedipus does. The the preconditions of all of that, because it's sort of subsumed into what Oedipus is itself. How Oedipus works, I suppose so, I should say. I might have something here unless you want to move on. No, I find this I find this actually pretty fascinating because it's incredibly relevant okay. to today's world. Okay, so um so, so I have an example. Um, uh, so, so representation and segregation. Um, so, where does the enjoyment come from for flying like a a, a blue lives matter flag or an all lives matter flag? Um, it's it's not that uh, I enjoy from some sort of direct holistic identity, my enjoyment comes from what that representation excludes. Um, so I enjoy the all lives matter flag because it excludes the, the black lives matter notion or something like this. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's sort of the psychoanalytic sentiment in, in this realm of segregation and enjoyment is that the the enjoyment isn't necessarily a a cohesive group identity like in some sort of positive sense the cohesion and the group identity the enjoyment that that secures all of this is predicated on a um on an exclusion on a persona non grata on an enjoyment of the other that is that is feared and then representations are used to secure this. 
I like that. Uh, Holland says similarly, uh, historically, the content or rationale for segregation has varied considerably. Totem, clan, religion, race, nation, sorority, fraternity, sports team, and so on. But the form of the illegitimate synthesis remains the same. On the basis of a segregation aligning the subject with a superior us versus an inferior them, a fixed sense of identity arises that rejects as undesirable the multiform possibilities of nomadic subjectivity. It's the nature of, uh, again, on the one side you have the paranoiac, on the one side the schizo. The paranoiac demands knowledge and the understanding and belief of segregation and tying two things. Oedipus, by utilizing representation the way it does, illegitimately uses that last synthesis right before you're created, as it starts creating those sensations and putting those things together. It creates that moment where it says, oh, this is actually what you are. I am a white man. I'm an American. Uh, I am uh, tall, straight, cis, uh, you know, monogamous, uh, not into poly, like all of these things that I am versus the things that I am not, which is also implicit. It's one of the things Oedipus and other representations do, Oedipus being kind of a brutal one, again, because the natural binary of what you have a choice of is to identify with mommy and daddy. Uh, the nuclear family is a, just an awful version of this. Um, but ultimately, it, it reduces, uh, as, as he goes on to say, uh, uh, nuclear family, the segregation of it, reduces to only two the range of subject positions generated within it. Uh, the object of desire, agent of prohibition, mommy, daddy. That's why Oedipal subjectivity is so abstract, guilt-ridden, and modern, because its entrapment in this narrow confines of the nuclear family as a segregated institution of reproduction under capitalism. It's a very, very particular setup that the entire thing operates with. Um, but to continue, I'm going to read the next paragraph because it flows off of the Lacan quote and what uh, Ken was just saying. Uh, this is not a question of ideology. There is an unconscious libidinal investment of the social field that coexists, but does not necessarily coincide with the preconscious investments or with what the preconscious investments, quote, ought to be. That is why when subjects, individuals, or groups act manifestly counter to their class interests, when they rally to the interests and ideals of a class that their own objective situation should lead them to combat, it is not enough to say they were fooled. The masses have been fooled. It is not an ideological problem, a problem of failing to recognize or of being subject to an illusion. It is a problem of desire, and desire is part of the infrastructure. Preconscious investments are made, or should be made, according to the interests of the opposing classes, but unconscious investments are made according to positions of desire and uses of the synthesis very different from the interests of the subject, individual, or collective who desires. It's a lot. It's a lot at once. Uh, any questions on this before we dive further into the uh, how the investments operate? No, well, Michael's right. This is... Um, uh, I try not to talk about ATP at all. Um, this is 100% about uh, what it means to live a nomadic life versus uh, sort of the opposite. Um, this is more talking about the opposite, though. They don't quite get into that. Um, everyone is still here, Misha. I think, uh, I'm think are people still listening? Can you hear me, Misha? I, I can hear everything. Well, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, we, we'll, we'll troubleshoot afterwards. Good luck. Uh, change your disconnect and reconnect usually fixes it pretty quickly. Um, any any questions, thoughts uh, around this? Because uh, they're talking about, again, a thing they've brought up very lightly, but they're starting to get into the idea of pre-conscious versus unconscious investments, uh, which is its own really difficult, fun thing. Does anyone here want to take a crack at it? Because I don't have a smart way of saying it. Take a crack at what, sir? What's the difference between uh, unconscious and pre-conscious investments? Um, well, in order to make like the distinction between unconscious and conscious, there has to be some kind of uh, coding, right? 
something it has to be coded into something that can be separated in the first place. And I would say pre-conscious implies that it like comes before um, that code, that that it's even possible to to separate that way. Perhaps in the in the same vein that they might use um, intensive. Hmm. Well, I like that. One of the challenges I've had is I've heard people literally claim, and I'm not sure it. I, I haven't been able to see a lot for it that uh, we Deleuze and Guattari are basically saying we have an unconscious, we have a pre-conscious, and we have a conscious. And I'm not sure that necessarily flows more that they are describing how the unconscious functions and then other things come from that. Uh, is that close or no? I, I'm sure it's like somewhat existential, right? Like we just happen to have uh, structures in place to see things as either conscious or unconscious, but that doesn't mean that that's like an inherent part of the way that we think, but it's still real in a sense because we see it that way. Is everyone following so far? Because now we've gotten into, this isn't a matter of ideology, which you will hear, turn on the news. Uh, they'll talk either about Trump supporters or Biden supporters, the right or the left, as all of these things are being uh, done by ideology. That, uh, that the matter of a Trump supporter or someone who's on the right wing, why are the poor whites voting for someone who's so rich? It's in their best interest to go otherwise. That's just because people lied to them or they tricked them with gun rights or whatever. The argument here is no, no, uh, it's not that at all. It's because of the nature of the structure we've placed the unconscious in, they actually are demanding the segregation. They're they're demanding that they be the thing that they think they are, or that society has built them to believe that they are. And as soon as they've started segregating themselves out, uh, they started exactly separating out other people too. So... It's a, it's a lot. If anyone has questions, though, very much. Uh, Ken asks, isn't this also a problem with the notion of pure identity in general? In order to make X to X equals X, I have to exclude everything that is antithetical to that pure identity. Yeah, well, yes. I think um, the, the bits I was reading from uh, 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 Holland, I think, really state it very clearly that in order to align with an us there has to be a them it's uh, the nature of representation is that it is exclusionary uh, and separating and uh, separates out what could be dozens of connections uh, millions of connections millions of possibilities and odd combinations of things that we can't even necessarily lay representation to but instead the moment i say that i'm white that has connotations to it and it becomes a thing because it also means that all of you are not. Um, race being one of the easier, more obvious ones, but class being a very, very nice uh, other one. These investments of an unconscious nature can ensure the general submission to a dominant class by making cuts and segregations pass over into a social field insofar as it is effectively invested by desire and no longer by interests. A form of social production and reproduction, along with its economic and financial mechanisms, its political formations, and so on, can be desired as such, in whole or in part, independently of the interests of the desiring subject. It was not by means of a metaphor, even a paternal metaphor, that Hitler was able to sexually arouse the fascists. It is not by means of a metaphor that a banking or stock market transaction, a claim, coupon, a credit, is able to arouse people who are not necessarily bankers. And what about the effects of money that grows, money that produces more money? There are socioeconomic complexes that are also veritable complexes of the unconscious and that communicate a voluptuous wave from the top to the bottom of their hierarchy, the military-industrial complex. And ideology, Oedipus, and the phallus have nothing to do with this, because they depend on it rather than being its impetus. For it is a matter of flows, of stocks, of breaks in the fluctuations of flows. Desire is present wherever something flows and runs, carrying along with it interested subjects, but also drunken or slumbering subjects, toward lethal destinations. Hitler gets the fascists hard in the French version. Yeah, it's a, 
that's actually much better it's 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 quite intentional language though because uh the reality we're talking about is that these actions uh excite people and they do so at the libidinal level They're like there is that desire that is being aroused and played with and tickled uh the same with if you didn't watch wall street bets and everything that happened with gamestop uh go go there the the absolutely insane nature of most of those comments was absolutely sexual like not even like un- like ironically like uh, i think the top post right now on reddit in the last year was something about it and the top comment was stop i can only get so erect like this is not a they're not really being like dancing around it like it's literally this is the nature it's excite and it's exciting like anyone who's like opened their bank account you'd have to be you you're born in the same society i am if you've ever opened your bank account for your first big paycheck or a big payday you got and it's like it's it's good it feels good it's fucked up uh oh sorry loomer <laughs> sorry loomer i don't I, your little cousins are listening that's not uh i i warn you against letting little cousins listen to me um it's it's the nature with all this and mobile games and the like is an excessively perfect version of it too uh they're able to excite you and we know this game designers are very aware um we're able to excite you through the same sound effects that gambling machines uses uh when you win or when you tap something we can make things seductive like we know how to utilize desire to get things to happen now the traditional way of thinking about this is that desire is something that is molded by oedipus or by our psyche after the fact that uh, our we're, we're making choices uh which is hilarious given what we know and deleuze's and guattari's argument is no they're look there are these complexes and uh, ver- that are incredibly complex on top of the unconscious that do all of this shit and the real reality is oedipus the phallus ideology all of these things feed off of the way that this desire is being manipulated they attach after the fact just like we attach ourselves after the fact my anger towards black people it's like oh that's what that is and i attach meaning and ideology to it after the fact i don't actually it's just an example fucking just an example the the ability for us to be playing with all of this and not having it be sexual to not have it be something that's driving it it is across the board the hypersexuality of commentary across all of it was amazing um oh it's fucked up it's wild it's amazing uh the line here at the very end though uh the last two for it is a matter of flows stocks breaks and fluctuations of flows Desire is present wherever something flows and runs, carrying along with it interested subjects, but also drunken or slumbering subjects to lethal destinations. Um, the, we are interested. We also might be not really all there. We might be not quite thinking straight for a number of different reasons. Um, and desires are happy to take us with them. That's, that's the way they work. Uh, the use of lethal destinations is, is interesting here. Uh, Mikhail, I have to ask, in the French translation, is that pretty much spot on? Sorry, I was just uh, getting a charger. Um, what's the English? Where is it? It's uh, the drunken or slumbering towards uh, lethal destinations, the end of the paragraph. Um, that, um, lethal, yes, uh, deadly. Um, destination is a bit different in French. Um, uh, oh God, how do you call that? Um, it's actually uh, using a word that. Um, um, how, how do you say the um, the part of the um, river that uh, flows into the sea? Do you say the mouth of the river in English too? Yes. Uh, um, he's actually saying that he's uh, using a word that we use for the, the mouth of a river. So there's also the idea of a mouth. That's interesting. So uh, that's interesting because that implies, well, that's actually, uh, thank you, by the way, because I think that changes the meaning. So someone was talking. So about, it's kind of a, the flow. So the flow of a river. So the river goes to a, a deathly destination. Yeah. 
It's, is it a deathly, deathly destination or is it a deathly, uh, the, the nature Sorry, of Sorry, death, like, deathly end of the river when it goes into when the, it, the When ocean. it becomes sort of, when it disappears into that kind of larger, gigantic, like there's a, there's a poetry there to that that seems really interesting. Well, deadly destination reminds me of like the death drive or something, right? But the connotation of like the place upon which uh, a, a river meets the sea sounds um, like Heraclitus, <laughs> for one thing. Uh, a man cannot step into the same river twice, for he is not the same man, it is not the same river, which is obviously like a a big inspiration for um, Deleuze as well. Um, and also, it, it, it kind of reminds me of like um, these, like the point at which the, the, the line or whatever, the band of intensity on the body without organs fades into the the body without organs, you know, reaches its its uh, end in brackets. Well, and if we think about uh, the subject as being effectively carried by his desiring machines, this long lineage of them, as it's sort of carrying along and he's seeing it as them, at some point the idea that it hits the sea or the molar or the sort of large mishmash that is the social machines and getting lost in that and having that this drives you towards that and the lethal destinations, the lethal moment where the your literal desires become sort of a drop in an ocean. Uh, I, I think it, it, it it's like to the end of the self as well, if that, if that makes sense. Like It's like the subject moving across the body with their organs, right? There's this point where the subject, they kind of, they don't realize like what's happening is they're like, Things that come, you know, forming on the body without organs that happens to take the shape of the subject, but then use itself. And at the edge of the subject, they're like things are bleeding back in. I really like that imagery a lot. It's much better than lethal destinations, which is kind of an odd, has a different uh, connotation with it, I think. It's interesting. Yeah, Thank you, Mike, very much. Um, any questions at this point? Because we're about to dive into kind of the next part uh, as we sort of uh, clear out to the end of the two paragraphs left. Uh, anything on this last little grouping about really all of this, because we're about to talk about their solution for it, how we talk about it, and things like that. Uh, anything here about anything at this point uh, previous? All right, uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to read, and then here's what's going to happen. I'm gonna, just going to bust through the next two paragraphs because they are, um, what, they are fairly clear. And then uh, at that point, we're going to go back, and if anyone has a question for this entire section, and it is a long section, I'm completely aware, uh, we are going to uh, have those questions. So please, everyone, get your, your questions uh, at the ready, um, or we are going to sit for like an hour in silence, and it's going to suck so hard. Like, Jesus, it's going to suck. Um, all right. It's hence the goal of schizoanalysis, to analyze the specific nature of libidinal investments in the economic and political spheres, and thereby to show how, in the subject who desires, desire can be made to desire its own repression, whence the role of the death instinct in the circuit connecting desire to the social sphere. Oh, see there, you were right, uh, webcam. It's a... Uh, interesting um all this happens not in ideology but well beneath it an unconscious investment of a fascist or reactionary type can exist alongside a conscious revolutionary investment inversely it can happen rarely that a revolutionary investment on the level of desire coexists with a reactionary investment conforming to a conscious interest in any case conscious and unconscious investments are not of the same type even when they coincide or are superimposed on each other. We define the reactionary unconscious investment as the investment that conforms to the interest of the dominant class, but operates on its own account, according to the terms of desire, through the segregative use of the conjunctive syntheses from which Oedipus is derived. I am of the superior race. The revolutionary unconscious investment is such that desire, still in its own mode, cuts across the interest of the dominated, exploited classes and causes flows to move that are capable of breaking apart both the segregations and their edible applications. 
flows capable of hallucinating history, of reanimating the races in delirium, of setting continents ablaze. No, I am not of your kind. I am the outsider and the deterritorialized. Quote, I am of a race inferior for all eternity. I am a beast, a negro. End quote. I'm going to finish here. There again, it is a question of the intense potential for investment and counterinvestment in the unconscious. Oedipus disintegrates because its very conditions have disintegrated. The nomadic and polyvocal use of the conjunctive syntheses is in opposition to the segregative and biunivocal use. Delirium has something like two poles, racist and racial, paranoiac segregative and schizonomatic. And between the two, ever so many subtle, uncertain shiftings where the unconscious itself oscillates between its reactionary charge and its revolutionary potential. Even Schreber finds himself to be the great Mongol when he breaks through the Aryan segregation. Whence the ambiguity in the text of great authors, when they develop the theme of races as rich in ambiguity as destiny itself. Here, schizoanalysis must unravel the thread. For reading a text is never a scholarly exercise in search of what is signified, still less a highly textual exercise in search of a signifier. Rather, it is a productive use of the literary machine, a montage of desiring machines, a schizoid exercise that extracts from the text its revolutionary force. The exclamation, so it's, or the meditation of idiotur on race in an essential relationship with madness. Yeah, so this... I, I mean, I think there's a there's a, a lot to say there. I think that whole last section on that last page, I could almost rant endlessly about <laughs> what they're talking about with like a literary machine in the text. There's a an essay by Foucault that seems like very similar to this. Um, and obviously Deleuze and Foucault were quite close. Um, called "What Is an Author," where he where he sort of pontificates on uh, the authorial uh, i can't remember the he uses the word like machine the author machine or the author process um but i, I actually want to go back to the earlier bit first when they talk about the 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 revolutionary you know sits alongside the fascist just fine I, I um, also love that last little bit, by the way. So I'm, I'm in agreement. Like the last little bits here, we can have it just honestly like hours of discussion. Uh, but please continue your point. Yeah, sorry, I got interrupted. Um, yeah, uh, because obviously this this moment. I mean, you don't have you can you don't have to say fascism. Some people would say like, oh, you know, you need to kill the cop in your head or whatever, right? This this moment where you decide there's there's, a, there's almost a moment of of a radical. Um, revolutionary, you know, inside you moment when you decide to be a fascist, right? All fascist moments are born from some kind of territorialization that isn't, is of, of itself radical, right? That is of itself revolutionary. You're deciding the thing ends here. Um, and, and there's that moment is always waiting, like behind the, the fascism, and it's about being open. That's like the difference, right, between like the the schizophrenic process is that you're more open to to these um, these radicalizations continuing. That's the demanding that knowledge is like a very particular thing. It's an easy trap to fall into. I do it myself mm. all the time. It's it's a very easy thing as you're reading and it, oh, this is what this means. It's this thing right here, uh, versus. The ability to sort of, as they say, um, have the text as a literary machine, a schizoid exercise that extracts from the text a revolutionary force. It's an amazing uh, wording of the entire thing instead of playing with its revolutionary representations, which I think is uh, would almost be hilarious if someone were to say this about this book. The reality is they're saying, no, no, it's it's about the opposite. It's about not talking about what a thing is. It's about instead utilizing any text or anything as this process. And I really, uh, I just adore that line of thinking. It's not easy. It's tough, especially when you're raised quite the opposite. Uh, and it's a, it's a habit that we form. It's a habit that gets put into us easily. 
I mean, this is like the new popular notion, right? That the author, the author's intention has ultimate say over what a, a, a certain text says or whatever. Like author statements about a text are like, the author said it, so that's what it is, right? And and we have this very, there's like this hierarchy, the strange hierarchy where the author like sits above the text. Um, when for most of history, it was not like that. That's kind of like a thing that came along with, with property rights in the 1800s, right? So it's like a cultural, it's like a cultural phenomenon. Um, I think it's funny because they, they're kind of doing the opposite. They're doing, they're reaching the same conclusion, but they're doing the opposite of what Derrida does, where they're saying, actually, a text is like any other thing. And Derrida kind of says like, well, any other thing is just like a text. Um, I like that. I, I you think can, you, you would probably piss off a Deleuze person or two, but I actually, that's, that's really spot on. I actually uh, totally agree with that. I mean, I think I was making this point in another discussion uh, just recently, actually. That's great. They definitely have their, their similarities. I mean, there's a lot of differences as well. I'm sure I, I could be very critical in, in a Derridaian way or whatever of what they say at the end there, but I'd rather be constructive, you know? Um, yeah. And, and there's like this notion of why, why should we stop? Why should we stop interpreting? And I guess that's quite like a Nietzschean thing as well. Like, why, why do we, why do we stop? Um, why, why do we like say we want to stop this affirmation of pure difference, which is like something that Dillers talks about in his book on Nietzsche. Um, that there's like a difference. There's a difference between like a, a Hegelian like dialectic or whatever, like something on the inside. Like you take the whole or whatever, and then oh, eventually within the whole, something arises to challenge the whole. And it's like, no, why don't we just treat things actually as other, as actually different and leave it open to, to viewing it um, outside of the, uh, our own context um, in that way or in a wider context? Yeah, they're just playing back into the idea of uh, allowing desire to be its thing. You know, the, the paragraph a few bits ago, I, I scroll back up to it in the, uh, the one I'm streaming, where they say uh, it is not by means of a metaphor uh, that Hitler was able to sexually arouse the fascists. Like that line has like a lot of context to it, a lot of ways to take it. But the two, I mean, on the one side, it's them saying that it wasn't that like Oedipus, like it wasn't that like Hitler didn't do this by metaphor. Hitler didn't win everyone over by saying, well, maybe this sort of thing, let me tell a story. Like he was able to directly interface with desire and that nature of things when they're talking at this very end part about how uh, literature does very much the same thing and Deleuze will go on uh, in uh, Francis Bacon uh, Deleuze's The Logic of Sensation is a wonderful treatise on how this functions. Uh, the diagrammatics with him and Quattery, I think, uh, I want to say the Fisciality Plateau, like across the board, we're talking about a lot of ways that talking about how desire is directly interfaced with these things rather than you know, these weird layers and abstractions and representations that we put on top of stuff. Sure, that's maybe how we talk about things, but that's not what's directly dealing with us. Uh, it's not by means of a metaphor that a banking or stock market transaction, a claim, coupon, or credit arouses people who are not bankers. It's because it's dealing directly with their design. Yeah, it's sort of easy to just kind of say, oh, all the fascists are just being com completely irrational or whatever, like they're just awful and then like there's nothing substantive like to them at least obviously not to us but to them there's something substantive to what they're doing it's not just like this from from the air you know thing like hitler was successful because he was convincing um Srif asks uh, was last week's reading of the first part of the section recorded I wish it was only last week's reading. The last two weeks' readings of this section are recorded. Uh, they're on YouTube if you go to our live streaming. Uh, they will be on the podcast whenever I decide to stop being a lazy asshole and get uh, caught up properly. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Um, probably the next couple of days. I should get us pretty close to caught up. Um, the uh, Rimke asks, and it's a great question, is what is Igitur? Uh The line being uh, the exclamation... So it's, or the meditation of Ijitur on race in an essential relationship with madness. Uh, Michael wants to take on Ijitur. Yeah, um, I actually uh, bought uh, this book today to understand. Um, so, the... oh God, can you hear me now? This microphone is uh, yeah. really interesting. Yeah, you're, you're this uh, is yes. not very easy to use. I don't know. How, can I 
microphone on? I don't think I can. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so um, it's a um, story by Malarmé, which is uh, basically um, we only got uh, fragments of it. He never really uh, wrote, uh, uh, finished it. So the fragments were published. Um, so I have here a um, quick explanation of the storyline, and I'll translate it into English straight away. So the main character is the ultimate, the last um, uh, heir of its, of its race, is invited by a prediction in a book to accomplish an immemorial um, thing, an act who's supposed to abolish um, Ah, randomness, um, hazard, no, hazard is different in English. Um, randomness, let's say. So he's getting out of the room and goes downstairs with the book and the candle in an undergrad passage to the tombs of his ancestors. He's conscious of the vanity of his acts, but um, he's following this um, ancestor's destiny, and he accomplishes the act, which is uh, throwing dice. Um, I think it's um, it reminds also uh, me of um, the poem about throwing dice that Marami um, did, that uh, never did a throw um, of dice abolish randomness. Um, so it throws um, dice and um, lies down on his ancestors' ashes. <laughs> so it's interesting. And the idea of Igitur, um, that uh, they are saying um, that it is, um, that's basically uh, because um, most people think Igitor is, um, the name Igitor is coming from um, um, Ergo, as in uh, Cogito Ergo Sum from Descartes. Um, and I think I understood that Malame wrote, um, started wanting to write this story from after reading uh, the Descartes meditations. Well, that's more than, I did not even know any of that. Thank you. Jesus, and I, it's not the kind of thing you can Google either. Because I tried and I was getting a nothing like that. Go ahead, I think uh, webcam. Because um, because it was never it's it's just um, um, a, a notes about the story they found in his papers that they published. So I'm not sure even how you could translate that because it's just random notes put together. Um, also, I mean, "igita" is just like the Latin word for for therefore, right? In some context, so. If you searched it, it would just yeah, come up. Exactly. Right there. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in uh, the essay of Ifukai I referenced earlier, which comes out around the same time as anti Oedipus, actually, and I'm sure he was in conversation with Deleuze because they were both professors at the same university at the time, right? Um, he uh, references the exact same text, um, and also he talks about Nietzsche's notes, um, how, you know, oh, should we consider all of Nietzsche's notes and, and like, his laundry bill or whatever? Um, to be uh, part of his writings, does he have you know? Does the authorial process extend even to that? And I think he uses like this Malame text as an example, like of these notes that were kind of put together into some substantive whole, uh, despite that having nothing to do, you know, despite Malame not actually doing that himself. Um, and Derrida kind of takes <laughs> that same point in that essay to its ridiculous extent when he does like Nietzsche's philosophy of umbrellas you know takes the note left behind from Nietzsche saying I have forgotten my umbrella and using like some ridiculous notion of authorial, authorial intent like creates an entire philosophy of umbrellas about oh what did Nietzsche mean when he said he forgot his umbrella um that I think is is quite funny um and, and it's almost like a this idea of looking at a text in a certain way is like its own odopolization like the authors at the top or whatever. It's like the master signifier. It's like the phallus. Yeah, I think actually this um, was edited at the, at the time of, uh, of the writing of Antiodipus. And um, mine is a new version where they actually um, explain that um, 
original editor uh, put them in a certain way, so basically changed um, maybe what, uh, yeah, the, the way things were put together, and the, the new version is actually just the notes in the order where we found them, really. Um, Loomer brings up a film that is actually, I think, very relevant to this uh, bit. It's a, a Czech film called The Cremator. Uh, it's absolutely worth watching if you haven't, if you can find a copy, uh, maybe we'll do a viewing of it at some point. Uh, it tells the story of a, a man in uh, 1930s uh, Austria, Czech, no, Czech, Czech Republic, uh, who's bordering Austria, and he's a cremator, uh, and he's kind of a nice guy, like just normal dude, kind of. Um, there's a scene in it that comes to mind. Uh, he He gets introduced to a German or an Austrian uh, who comes over and he's like, hey, you should you should join the Nazi party. Nazis are great. Hitler's amazing. And he's like, oh, I can't. Uh, I'm Czech. I'm born Czech, raised Czech, died Czech. Grandparents are Czech. Everyone's Czech. And the German, uh, he says, uh, he says to the German, he goes, I probably only even have one drop of German blood in me after all this time. And the German looks at him and goes, yes, well, uh, we sensitive people. We can smell that drop. Uh, and it suddenly becomes this really odd situation where he switches from early in the film, having no understanding or really clear nationalistic ties to suddenly taking this on a little bit more, um, and more and more and more and more and more. And, uh, I won't ruin the film. It is really dark. Um, it is very dark. And it is very depressing, but it is the story of how a person can be told what they are by just a few simple words uh, that don't even have, like, not even scientific, positive, logical bullshit truth. But like, oh, yeah, maybe I can smell it. You, you got a drop of blood in you. Don't worry. It's like at that point, he suddenly he, he's like, oh, I'll probably be safe because I have that drop of blood. And everyone starts having it's it just shifts the conversation to being this entire other thing I absolutely what they're talking about here a hundred percent what they're talking about here because it changes his entire outlook on life slowly corrupting him when he does tell he does some terrible shit um terrible shit uh terrible shit um man that book oh, i shouldn't have brought up that movie it's terrible terrible depressing film good film though um yeah uh, all right so uh, before I dive uh, too further, it was uh, the, uh, the cremator. Uh, I don't even know what it is in its original language. I just noticed that. Um, all right. So now we finished this section as we've gone over uh, sort of how Oedipus uh, works with the subject, how it creates and messes with desire during the third synthesis, uh, during the paralogisms that it, it, it sort of suffers upon us. What questions do you have? What issues do you have? What thoughts do you have? Where would you like a little bit more time spent? We have some time right now. I've got uh, time to just allow this to become really awkward and long with a shit ton of silences. So please uh, ask a question. Not sure you understand what, sir. You uh, cut out there. Um, sorry, mathematic, mathematic stuff. Um... And I'm still not sure I understand the, this idea that you fold, um, um, you fold um, something and the f the four corners become three. Three. All right, one second. I gotta find the section. I'm not sure what section you're talking about, but yeah, uh, folding a square in half along, you know, diagonally is a example of that, right? Okay. So I guess mummy, daddy would be the same for those two people. I mean, I, Brooks will have to find the context, but it seems like the elimination of uh, like you're, you're, you're taking away and then you're just like bundling everything into Oedipus. So it's like you're folding away that whole side of, of uh, things. Think of all that's lost in, in the square, perhaps, as what is lost when one Oedipalizes. So and it's so it's uh, top of one hundred one, bottom of one hundred. Uh, to read the section aloud, 
Uh, the Oedipal operation consists in establishing a constellation of biunivocal relations between the agents of social production, reproduction, and anti-production on one hand, and the agents of the so-called natural reproduction of the family on the other. This operation is called an application. And this is the line. It is as if a tablecloth were being folded, as if its four corners were reduced to three. From that moment, it is a foregone conclusion that the collective agents will be interpreted as derivatives of or substitutes for parental figures in a system of equivalence that rediscovers everywhere the father, the mother, and the ego. Uh, to very much simplify this, I think this may be actually them stating something complicated. This is their attempt to be simple, I think. Uh, so how, how I read this is very much what Webcam Parent said, that uh, if you imagine it's a four corners or a thousand corners, because they use the example of a tablecloth, take all of the points. Let's make a big geometric shape of all of the things in your life right now that is connected to you via social production, reproduction, anti-production in the entire social sphere of your experience. Like, just do that for a second. Think of how many it is. It's more than four, by the way. Now, let's reduce all of those to three corners. Now, when you fold them, when you fold those points, the points start to overlap. So everything, every one of those points in that geometric shape, uh, inside of any actor network, inside of any you know connected tissue network graph we may have, if we reduce it to three, every point overlaps on one of the three, mommy, daddy, or me. So either every relation that I have is me, or it is mommy, or it is daddy. This is what they're trying to it's a terrible way of uh, doing it, but this is, I think, what they're trying to say at, that everywhere suddenly discovers mommy, daddy, me, where it's uh, Brooks goes to work and I see the secretary. I say, hi, I go to my desk. I'm in a desk of about 22 people and I have different relations with all of them. I have a manager, I have a larger manager, and I have a CEO of the company, as well as I have the people at the security guard at the front desk. And as I walk outside, I see the parking attendant and I say, hi, this is all of that. But my relations in all of this have to be reduced to three points. Everything does. That's the nature of Oedipus. It's a, the forced application of it. And it is absolutely something that these people sort of go with and people in general do. So it's why everything is, that's Brooks having a poor relationship with his dad or he has daddy issues. A girl strips. Oh, she has daddy issues. Daddy wasn't around yeah, yeah. a lot, mm -hmm. et cetera. I mean, maybe a, 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 a different way of putting it is if we had like the tablecloth, right? And uh, diagonally, whatever, it's blue on one side and it's red on the other. And blue is like all the stuff that could reasonably be Oedipal, right? And red is all the stuff that isn't. And then uh, somebody comes along, you know, Freud or whatever comes along and he folds the tablecloth and he's like, it's a blue tablecloth, look, it's blue. And you're like, it's not, I know it's not blue, you folded it. Like, what about before you folded it? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's all blue. You can't show me a red part of this tablecloth. It all looks blue. I found that to uh, a lot of um, the problems I have in general to understand uh, these kind of text is I need to have a, like a mind picture. And a, a lot of the time uh, it's um, difficult to picture things. Uh, I think um, it's not... They're just using it as like another way of explaining it, right? I don't think it's necessary to understand it that way. Yeah, yeah, but it, it makes um, makes perfect sense. Because I don't really go for like the geometric visual stuff either, to be honest. No, I'm trying. I tried to explain it. So again, I think your explanation's great. It's very simple. What they're trying to say here is just everything ends up being collapsed. It doesn't matter how many times and it reduces everything to these three everything to the three so why they use the I, four I plus i think it's hand. also uh, sorry i think it's um another there's a difference sorry between 3d and 2d and then you say something in, is is in 2d but there's actually a lot you're missing if you go in the third dimension i'm going to think through ways to explain this better but uh yeah it's fair. It's, it's, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, move on a little bit and say, how do we feel about the term paralogistic? Let's um, the fallacious logic uh, at a basic level um, is how I understand the term. It's a 
uh, something that seems logical but isn't. Um, it, it's it's alongside logic, right? Para alongside yeah. logic. Um, yeah, the the use of paralogism is interesting here because it's uh, contrasted with syllogism, and I can only assume that these terminologies and all of this ultimately stems from difference in repetition from the syntheses he talks about there and ultimately from Kant. But yeah, I, it's an odd use of, it's an odd term that I think um, has some baggage with it that I've never really super liked, but that's how I understand it here. Yeah. I guess I just don't really, um, or I, I, I understand like the, the, the standard way it might be used, but I'm curious if anybody thinks that they're doing something special with it. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's an, it's got an extra layer to it here because no. So they specifically go out of their way saying that this isn't about tricking people, but uh, again, paralogism, especially how Kant sort of talked about it and how he used it, it had it. There's a, there's a level of allusion to it um, in kind of its original intention. Uh, maybe I'm misreading Kant. It has, uh, I'm not an expert at all, at all, at all. Um, but it has sort of that connotation with it that is, I think, interesting. Um, it's a logical fallacy, something that people believe that isn't simply true. But that would imply here something different than I think they're trying to say. Because if they're saying that this is a paralogism, yet it's not that people are tr it's not that people are being tricked, but instead that they're using it. They're uh, uh, how to put it. Um, it's not that people are necessarily being tricked by the representation into believing it. It's, uh, oh, they had the wool pulled over their eyes, which paralogism kind of implies, in my understanding. They're saying here that the paralogism is like a, a d specific thing that we actually can say is an improper use of the natural synthesis, the natural process of things. It's almost like a unnatural use is what they've kind of changed paralogism to mean in this sense, which is... Interesting. I mean, I, th I think in some sense, especially over on like the Anglo analytic side, there's like a temptation to say anything that doesn't logically follow is is not true, right? It was wrong, or not, or not useful, or not worth talking about. And in that sense, like the term paralogic or paralogistic or paralogism would be derogatory. But I think in this more open text, right, it's actually not because there's like an acknowledgement of things that don't have to necessarily follow some sort of logical like syllogistic formal process to not be worth talking about no it's a it's a giant question because again so with to just go back to the the original sort of big usage in philosophies kant and it it's literally and i'm sitting googling it trying to find the quotes it's uh, paralogism is the result of false reasoning which can't be the case here because the paralogism in this case it's not like there's reasoning that happens around it there's no logic inside of the unconscious that's not how it functions like it, it just doesn't work like that so it's a it's an odd use of it classically it would have been viewed that way though classically you know reason was like a huge thing you know reason and logic oh everything has this basis of reason or logic right well we can we can move on 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 from that so oh, no, it's a it's a fair it's a fair conversation. At some point, I'd love to actually. I think the the use of the word and the word of syllog, use of syllogism as well, which is sort of the healthy, because they they don't say it outright, but there is a uh, there is what they believe to be a healthy or a uh, unhealthy way of utilizing the syntheses. One is a syllogism, the other is a paralogism. Like it's not necessarily a moral definition of either, or like full on judgment, but it kind of is like it kind of is there's a heavy implication that a paralogism's bad or Im improper perhaps would be the term yeah i think perhaps they're using it to suggest like Im improper unto what we're saying here is the process right rather than some historical um like when they say syllogism it's not like they're like ah yes you know aristotle's like Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, or whatever. Socrates is a mortal. They're uh, they're saying like, oh, this 
this is in line. This is like a, a correct way of looking at the way these desiring machines or processes or whatever are, are functioning. And then like a paralogism is like, well, it kind of seems like this, this should be the case. Like this is how these desiring machines or processes should function, but it's actually a, a mistake. Yeah. It's a, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you want to look at this quote Rem Remke Remk posted um, about um, desire can be made to desire its own repression. Kind of reminds me of um, Schopenhauer or it, well, it makes me think that they're like mocking like Schopenhauer and to an extent like Buddhism in like a, in like a Nietzschean way. Right. Because obviously, um, Schopenhauer is like, oh, you can't desire not to desire. Because that, you know, then your desire, like, you can't not desire because to not desire is to desire to not desire. And, uh, but on this, in this, like, analogy with, like, the with intensive processes across the body with their organs and territorializing and deciding an end to where desire is, you can actually close yourself off. You can actually, like, limit your creativity. Um, considering the desire has been flipped in this uh, in this book, right, from a lack to a to a creative process. Yeah, um, and to go back into the 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 paralogisms and how they sort of operate, um, the the nature of them as we have the moments where we have first uh, displacement, which is kind of the first paralogism that operates, uh, uh, Rimka, the. The first thing that happens is we actually have a completely broken sort of understanding of uh, what is actually signified or signified uh, within it and how desire becomes distorted and placed upon a secondary thing. Uh, as we move through the different sort of syntheses into the other paralogism, slowly desire ultimately becomes malformed, misshapen, triangulated, and then aimed. And so we can actually find that people become desiring of the th thing that is actually stopping their just like it's uh, they desire their own repression their desire desires to be oppressed it's a fascinating setup and you can follow their logic pretty clearly through the way that these different uh the three different syntheses operate and through the paralogisms uh, of it um the last part you ask about uh, the death instinct in that sentence um uh, the role of the death instinct in the circuit connecting desire to the social sphere is a <sighs> whole thing. I mean, I think it's essentially what was just being described, right? It's like this, uh, this, this wanting to to close yourself off from your own potential. Um, this desire for the end to your own desire, which I guess maybe a good analogy is like uh, in. Islamic faith. Um, it's not sinful to be homosexual, it's sinful to commit homosexual acts, right? And so there's always going to be this notion, you'll see it all the time if you if you look, look for it, if you look into any of these communities asking about homosexuality in Islam, there's many, many Muslims saying, I am homosexual, how can I stop being attracted to other men? Because I think it's to act upon it would be sinful. It's a it's a death instinct in it in a sense, right? It's like the end of the subjectivity of the subject. Like uh, if we kind of imagine it as like the egg or whatever of the body with our organs, and the subject is like floating around on it. There are going to be intensive processes that go outside the subject, and the schizophrenic would be okay with that, right? They would just accept that these things are kind of breaking free from from the borders of what they think of them as themselves, and the the subject would would change to suit this. Um, but the, but the fascist or, or, or whatever term you want to use would be reviled by it, right? It would be a shock to them. Um, and, and they would try their best to like kill it, to kill that, 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 uh, line of flight that goes away from what they view as like the borders of what, what is uh, reasonable. Yeah. It's a, uh, I, I, last time we were having this conversation, I used the example of a, I like to describe the death instinct in this case as a sort of desire for entropy. Death is 
there's a lot of connotations around the terminology, but like the idea of sort of the heat death of the universe, flatness, no energy, nothing happening, no desires, like just this sort of simplicity of that and the drive to that is kind of how they talk about this. And so when we're talking about the desire to end your own subjectivity, it's not ending yourself for the desire of like literal death. It's the the schizophrenic as things are falling apart and as the world is being destroyed, which is kind of all the only thing that's happening uh, as this sort of cast is able to sort of uh, dance with the punches and figure out how things can, can sort of be inside of the process rather than the paranoiac or the fascist or the reactionary who sees that and basically, uh, you know, aims at the f the heart of the black hole that's sort of sucking them in and starts to do battle, but not really uh, sort of move outside of that slowly, just sort of heading straight in. To make maybe quite a heavy reference here, it uh, reminds me of Heidegger's um, falling, falling into the world. So there's like this um, this way in which um, someone wants to, th there's this moment where you kind of realize, I guess maybe this is how Sartre would put it, where you realize that you have so many options, right? You can do whatever you want, like this existential problem. Um, and it's much easier, it's much less stressful to simply take what one is given by by das man, by, by they, the other, the all, however you want to translate it, um, and live that way, right? To To stop having to be make subjective decisions yourself to fall into the world to 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 the point where you know um you, you don't have to 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 be the other um and obviously world in this instance is, is from like the perspective of the person observing it so i think it fits in well here because somebody's had like these experiences or whatever that's like determining a border for them determining regions on the body without organs right and uh, it's stressful to to challenge that border for a lot of people, or it can be stressful um, because to you that's your world, right? It's easier to fall into the into that world. Yes, I I think it's I don't think it's as much of a hot take as you think. We have a Heidegger reading group for a reason. There's a decent <laughs> yeah. amount of crossover. Um, not a ton, but Heidi's always welcome. Heidi's always welcome. Did that uh, answer your question mostly, Rimka? Excellent. And apologies for not getting your name correct before. So, either way, good, good little, good name. Um, uh, next... I was going to say, um, Takun actually talk about that exact thing a lot. If anybody else is, is, is interested in further reading, uh, Theory of Bloom is kind of all about that exact. Um, notion i can't recommend anything to coon enough so yes uh we should do a we probably should do a reading at to for like some fun time i may i may get uh jack to do that in our uh, lit group at some point here soon that'd be great um i think other, we're knee then, deep in coon in the philosophy of science group Oh, I'm going to assume so. Let's live. I'm going to ask Bob Hope. Uh, any other questions while we're sitting here waiting? I am happy to sit here awkwardly. Unless everyone fully understands this, which is wonderful. I mean, are there any more ob ob obscure or, or terminology covered previously people are confused about? Like, um, subject or body without organs or anything oh, so asks, the subject is sorry go the ahead. result of the conjunctive synthesis well i mean it's the result of all of them right but the conjunctive synthesis is going to be the one that's like uh, uh i mean it's almost uh, 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 ulterior to all of them right like the subject it, it makes use of all of them but it's like a certain it's like a border and, and within that border, you know, all the synthesis can be found. But you could find all the synthesis outside of that border as well. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's the, the seeing it's the result of all three of them places it outside. Uh, this is 
One of the harder things to understand about the three syntheses is ultimately all of this stuff is imminently happening. There is no, like they happen in order, sort of, a bit, but there's no like, cool, one second it's this thing and then it's this and then it's this and then it's this and then it's this and then this other thing happens. It's, it's a more complex than that. Uh, the Again, a very short way of putting it. Uh, the first thing that happens is desiring machines connect to partial objects and then at some point they disconnect. In that process, a sensation is recorded, a uh, recording of some sort, and that is sort of thrown off to the side uh, from this energy. That's created, that's the body without organs is created in that moment, recording of that moment, of that sensation, of that satisfaction. Uh, but with that, uh, in the final conjunctive synthesis, that sensation needs to be consumed. We don't just, like, there isn't just a shit ton of sensation out there. It needs to be enjoyed by a thing. Uh, or suffered by a thing, I think they say is the two that they really go with, probably other things. But uh, the subject emerges after that sensation exists, the enjoyment, suffering that is produced from the interplay between production and anti-production, those two things firing off, and shit tons of it every moment, all the time. And then boom, subject sits there and like eats, the, <laughs> it consumes the enjoyment or suffering. And that's, that's you. And you get to go, hmm, oh, yes, that, that strawberry was good. Oh, yes, I liked that. It, you didn't. You Shit happened before I existed or before you even noticed it. But you're able to say that because it's sort of the nas na nature of uh, consummation. You get to have mastery or ownership uh, over that body without organs, which becomes you. That's uh, you. It's a fun part. So there, there I mean, is a I think, subject. I think Michael. even that is 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 pre-subject, right? Because that's like the conscious, but we could say that there is a conscious without the subject as well. So it'd be like an even, it'd be like another abstraction from that where one is actually regarding the self as an independent thing. Because I think it's possible for like a a, a very um, rudimentary intelligence, like a, a some insect or a bacteria or something, to understand or enjoy, you know eating or reproducing right um without them recognizing themselves as a subject yeah i think a lot of the stems it, it, it's probably best generally to think when we talk in these simplistic terms of a two-year-old or a one-year-old when they're literally learning how the world operates uh as the age we are we've these things are sort of not only second nature, but we've now layered in representations and understandings and phraseology and all kinds of bullshit on top of all of it but the the nature of like a, a three month old uh or a six month old or whatever where it goes like uh oh that like it pushes the dog and it sees its hand and goes oh that's me that boom right there that's the conjunctive synthesis and it's it's not that the baby goes oh that's my hand i have a hand like it doesn't think these words it doesn't have this conception so it's just the moment of recognition of its own sort of power and strength um so it's a uh, um, they, that's how I understand sort of where it kind of comes into play. So yeah, it's, it's pre-conscious. Yes, it's, it's unconscious. The, all of these things happen in the unconscious. This is not part of the conscious self. Um, although it really controls a lot of the conscious self. Uh, but that kind of that last step is where it's like, oh, that's me. Uh, I ate the strawberry. I did the thing. The, the immediate recognition of such an act is done prior to me even being able to place words to it. Or even say these words that I'm saying to you right now, which is wonderfully uh, confusing and difficult in itself. I mean, I think that's part of the power of of, of why it's it's the description of a desiring machine or or a process or a flow is so powerful, right? Because it's just describing a a, a way in which these intensive flows can can come about, and it doesn't have to be unconscious or conscious, because it's not like these things go away once the conscious is there, like they oh, they cross that border as well. Understand the connection he makes between Oedipus and desiring production, namely them both being at the end. I'm not sure what the passage says, but... It says, uh, thus it must be said of Oedipus, as well of desiring production, it is at the end, not the beginning. Uh, so, okay. Um... <sighs> We're going to have to separate a couple things out here so that 
the, the conversation around Oedipus, we need to understand they're making an argument against the idea that innately at the beginning of the existence of our soul conscious subjectivity, whatever the fuck wording, Oedipus is there. Oedipus is the natural state of our ego, id, and superego. And it is at the beginning. Uh, the, this is not the case. This is uh, where this is literally them saying it must be said. We'll get to desiring production in a second. It is at the end, not the beginning. Uh, but Ed Oedipus, uh, because Oedipus displaces the limit, internalizes limits of things. It's a, the sort of instrument of gregariousness. It's how we deal with things at a social level. There's, if I were, uh, if if we didn't have social societies, Oedipus wouldn't be a thing. It's it's by nature predicated upon the social structures that I'm within and how I interact with them. Because of that, it can't come at the end. Is sort of their beginning argument. The other half of that is where they talk about desiring production. Uh, we have seen that desiring production was the limit of social production, always thwarted in the capitalist formation, body without organs, at the edge of a deterritorialized socius, the desert at the gates of the city. But it is urgent, it is essential, that the limit be displaced, rendered inoffensive, that it pass or seem to pass into the social formation itself. I, they're talking at this point from the other direction, um, is how I read this, where they're... Uh, the, the limits of social production, where uh, the complexities of multiple humans and all sorts of things uh, working together, the limits of that are where m the actual desiring machines uh, sort of are. There's no desiring machines in, like, the desiring machines are literally everywhere, but we need to talk about them in order of regimes. We have the, the molecular regime, which is just the desiring production, like the little desiring machines connecting, disconnecting, creating, doing all that shit. And then we have the social machines. That's the molar. They are effectively think of them as meta desiring production. That is what it is. They're a meta level of the entire thing. So uh, at that meta level of desiring production, think about it as like a layer cake. You go down to a certain point and at some point you no longer have social machines. You only have desiring machines. Desiring production starts somewhere like it's, there's a line there. It's not a, hard line it's blurry and it's difficult but that line is what they're talking about here so uh we're able to surmise what oedipus signifies it displaces the limit internalizes it rather a society of neurotics than one successful schizophrenic who has not been made autistic oedipus the incomparable instrument of gregariousness is the ultimate private and subjugated territoriality of european man by breaking down the fuzzy wall between the social machine and the desiring machines by saying, which Oedipus does, that they're effectively the same fucking thing because I have to be Oedipalized in order to deal with society and all of society also has the triangle placed within it. We have suddenly changed a whole bunch of shit about how everything actually works. They want to reverse this. They're saying, actually, no, uh, Oedipus uh, doesn't come at the beginning of desiring machines, just as desiring machines don't come at the beginning of social machines. They're not in the same fashion, and they want to readjust these things. This is how I read that. I may have just explained it very poorly. I think maybe a, a, a somewhat jovial, <laughs> e easy way of, of making an analogy is, um, I'm sure we've all heard this kind of joke or whatever, like a philosophy of apples or whatever. Everything is either an apple or not an apple. It's like, okay, yes, te technically everything is either an apple or not an apple. But is, are we actually saying ontologically, right, that that is the relevant statement about all things? That before I decided to make this philosophy or whatever, everything was either an apple or not an apple. It's like, no, I came to that conclusion after observing things. And it's kind of like that with Oedipus, right? Like this stuff has to happen first before we decide that it's Oedipus uh, at all. It, 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 it happens after. Um, and I think it's the same thing with, with desiring production. I, I realize, I can only realize that I desire or want a thing after I'm like aware on some level, whether conscious or unconscious or pre-conscious of what that thing even is. But I'm aware that it even is a thing with a border. And it's easy to decide after the fact that everything is either mummy, daddy, or me. 
right? It's a, uh, it's easy, just like how how I can whatever just decide that after the fact everything is either an apple or not an apple, even though that has no uh, descriptive payload. The difference is is that Oedipus is then actually used to like um, orient the way uh, uh, society functions, or an individual decides to go about doing things in society. I like uh, Roger puts it simply too. That's, by the way, webcam much simpler mm -hmm. than mine. Thank you. Uh, Oedipus is an explanation not the driving machine uh i think it's a the the, na the nature of a confirmation bias or self-selection bias uh that we exist where it's like uh anything we believe we are going to find reasons to believe it <laughs> and uh, oedipus is kind of one of those explanations that you can find a way to fit everything and even more so you can actually convince yourself that it is the reality for you even and uh, I mean, it operates again, like representation. If I tell you, you need to be a man, like the nature of what that does to a child is, uh, incredible. Uh, it's, it's horrifying, but it's suddenly, I need to be a man, not find out whatever the fuck I am, not man, woman, anything, but like, just as a thing, I'm just a thing going out. Uh, the moment I say, well, I start from the place of being a man, which is what a lot of people do, or a woman, or a Christian, or an American, or Oedipalized, uh, it, it becomes determinate in how I deal with everything else. So it doesn't, uh, it's not at the beginning. It's not the thing that starts it. Uh, we aren't a Play-Doh machine with an Oedipus-sized little thing that we're pushing all of our Play-Doh through. Like, it's not that at all. It's a... Instead, actually, all of that's coming out, and then we have the Play-Doh machine on the other side, where we're forcing everything through at the end. <laughs> so that the issue you're having with the phrasing of the limit, we need a, it's tough to explain the difference between the two regimes of the molar and the molecular. Um, this limit of deterritorialization must now pass into the interior of the molar organization, and it must be applied to the factitious and subjugated territoriality. Uh, this limit is where I end and society begins. I'm just it's a decentered subject, whatever. But there's a there's a reality there that there is some point when that happens. It's where I, you know, just me, me versus all of it, or where uh, my desire machines are going, or the things I can be part of. The large scale, larger representation that limit. Oedipus displaces it and internalizes it within the subject. It's because society doesn't want unedipalized people and they'll get into this especially in capital especially in capital but everyone needs to be edipalized to deal with society at large and this becomes that thing where it's like this limit of where the person is now and where society stops because that kind of there's a downward force and an upward force uh i think they talk about that actually quite a bit later on uh the the pressures of society on a person the pressures of us upwards whatever it may be uh, internalizing that and having that forced inside of me, the limit being completely displaced, suddenly desiring machines are actually part of the social unit. Representation runs the desiring machine suddenly. That changes the entire relationship that desiring machines have to social machines. Now we have a social machine effectively inside of us, and that's what Oedipus does. It's an incomparable instrument of gregariousness. Uh, gregariousness in this case means uh, the sort of... Uh, you know, loudness within a crowd being uh, effective uh, uh de hitting all the other pool balls of people as you sort of make your way through and this is very much what they mean here as well it's a really really difficult thing to grab so i'm going to definitely i think i have to spend some more time on it um oh uh sorry michael um michael asks uh, they keep speaking about the wandering of the schizo is that coming from Freud Lacan? Uh, the Wandering of the Schizo is very early in the book. They talk about uh, schizo on a walk is a uh, better example than a patient on a couch in a psychoanalyst's office. That's paraphrasing. It's not a direct quote. Uh, the idea of a schizo on a walk is able to connect with effectively anything. Uh, it can kind of just go about its day and its life as a process as it's walking. Um, the That's their own from their own. So they continually use that imagery because the schizo on a walk is a big deal to them. It's someone who's freely sort of connecting as they go. 
it's funny that we have a word for uh, walking without uh, purpose in French, and you have to say out on a walk in English. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if out on a walk necessarily gets it across. Was I just completely, yeah, I didn't, I was muted, wasn't I? I've been reading. God damn it. In French, it would be something like errance. And, uh, you know, it's like wandering without an objective. Was I muted? You are. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so it is from uh, page nine. Uh, is where the line is. It's a schizophrenic out for a walk is a better model than a neurotic lying on the analyst's couch. A breath of fresh air, a relationship with the outside world. Lenz's stroll, for example, is reconstructed by Buckner. This walk outdoors is different from the moments when Lenz finds himself closeted with his pastor, who forces him to situate himself socially in relationship to the god of religion, in relation to, to his father, to his mother. While taking a stroll outdoors, on the other hand, he is in the mountains, amid falling snowflakes with other gods, or without any gods at all, without a family, without a mother, a father, or nature. What does my father want? Can he offer me more than that? Impossible. Leave me in peace. Well, um, I'll, I'll take a stab at a, a Boastgird's question. Uh, asks about, uh, specifically, um, on page 103, where they talk about reactionary versus uh, revolutionary investments. Uh, and it's towards the end of uh, one of those well, towards the end of the entire section where they're ultimately talking about kind of the nature of on one side you have, uh, let's see, where is the exact line? So uh, the reference is uh, midway through 105. The paragraph goes, uh, all this happened, not an ideology, but well beneath it, an unconscious investment of a fascist or reactionary type can exist alongside a conscious revolutionary investment. Inversely, it can happen rarely that a revolutionary investment on the level of desire coexists with a reactionary investment conforming to a conscious interest. Uh, the, the nature of a class, let's talk about class for a second, because I think that's a little bit of what they're hitting here. Uh, class is the thing that we are determinant of within our social structure. This is not a unconscious thing. This is the unconscious is not super aware necessarily of our class uh, or at all. And my place within society is an incredibly complex set of representations. Uh, my my value or uh, my incentive within being in a specific class within society changes based on a number of different factors. If I'm wealthy, white in America, yeah, it kind of incentivizes me to be a little bit on the reactionary side of things, for sure, uh, when it comes to my conscious investment. Uh, however, uh, vice versa, uh, someone who is a poor, uh, you know, a, a immigrant Mexican, uh, generally speaking, their class interest uh, is not that of the reactionary from a way that the society is structured kind of way. Now, uh, the unconscious investment of a person doesn't necessarily mask the uh, class that they may find themselves in at a social level. Instead, their desires are being played with at a different level, as they talk about a little bit later. And I'm, gonna, I'm not, not going to explain that, but I'm going to talk through instead the implications of it, because the, the nature of reactionary investments at an unconscious level is that of uh, segregation, separation, me being good, you being bad, uh, knowing what things are, demanding that we have specific definitions for things and that things are what they are and sort of, again, demanding and fighting for that, that paranoiac reactionary and sort of reaction. This can happen in a bunch of different ways. On the revolutionary side, I'm much more apt. A revolutionary unconscious investment is someone who is apt and uh, and ready for kind of change and embracing it and kind of, you know, dealing with things as they happen. Uh, very simplified version of it. What they're talking about here is that uh, an unconscious investment of a fascist or reactionary type, someone can be fascist in every single way or reactionary and also their class. They may be uh, poor Mexicans uh, living on the border in Texas. Uh, we saw with the latest uh, election, actually, more of them came out uh, by four or five times the number for Trump this last election than the election before, despite everything. Um, 
they may have a conscious revolutionary investment and and very much want that the world to change and say this. This is a thing you will hear uh, amongst a lot of reactionaries. They have a conscious revolutionary investment. The world needs to change. I need everything to shift. Uh, and the banks are destroying everything. The hegemony is ruining my life. Uh, we need to do something about the banks. This would be the revolutionary conscious investment. Uh, the unconscious investment, however, because they have in their desire the demand for things to be edipalized for by univocalization, for having hardened representation as being the truth that they need to get back to, or the fear that exists there, the kind of drive, the sexual desire that Hitler was able to get people excited with, or um, you know the, the allure of wealth that makes people excited, whatever it may be, can exist in the unconscious despite the, re the revolutionary conscious. They say it can happen the other way too. It's more rare. Uh, I, I can give you examples. It's a reactionary investment conforming to a conscious interest. Uh, the, well, the revolutionary desire is actually the unconscious, uh, is actually the sort of conscious side of that, which is a fascinating uh, thing. It happens the other direction. I look at Los Angeles and California, I think is a very simple version of this, of uh, people who have absolutely reactionary tendencies, but... Uh, you know, their they're generalized um, investment, uh, but instead their sort of desire is ultimately revolutionary. It's an interesting back and forth that pushes people in some odd directions. Um, so that's, that's how I understand they're explaining these, uh, is kind of those setups. Reactionary, Chris Dorner, reactionary tendency, revolutionary undercurrents, I think. Um I think that's it. California is filled with them. California is filled with them because they genuinely, their desires are, and it's very fascinating to talk to these people, but they're terrified of a lot of stuff and they react in a really odd way uh, in sort of their core desires. <laughs> but revolutionary uh, sort of undercurrents, which is fascinating. So it's a, it's what they're essentially saying is it doesn't matter your position or the complexities of where you're at in life. You can have a reaction or a revolutionary outward appearance or incentivization based on your class, based on who you are, based on where you're at and how you're in, you're dealing with things. But your unconscious is a whole different beast. And that can actually be reactionary or revolutionary based on a whole shitload of other things that we need to really start to start dealing with. That's the short version. And it. I do want to point out also their definitions of reactionary here, and it's important, uh, is different than a lot of political theory. They're specifically saying, and they say it cleanly, we define reactionary unconscious investment as investment that conforms to the interest of a dominant class, but operates on its own account according to the terms of desire through the segregative use of the conjunctive synthesis from which Oedipus is derived. I am the superior race. This is not a... Uh, I, reactionary has a million different meanings, but they're being very particular about the usage here. Revolutionary investments being uh, such that desire in its own mode cuts across the interest of the dominated, exploited classes, and causes flows to move that are capable of breaking apart both the segregations and their edible applications. Flows capable of hallucinating history, reanimating the races of delirium. But be very specific here. They're not saying, and they would say this, they are not saying revolutionary unconscious investment is against the dominant class. That's not what they're saying here. They're saying it's capable of cutting across, that the revolutionary unconscious investment cuts across the interest of the dominated exploited classes. It's not anti-people in power. It is not you know, pure class warfare. It's a very different take on what reactionary and revolutionary means. And it, this is going to be very important when we get into chapter three, as they start talking about the nature of the bourgeoisie and how power is actually distributed in capital and how we react to it. Yeah, Empty Set puts it right. A lot of people don't have a coherent political understanding of the world. Some people really hit the government and that manifests in contradictory ways. And what they do does, it's a one of the great lines is, be very wary of people who agree with you. It's a, one of my favorite online debates I ever watched was, uh, I won't say who, because no, people have different feelings about people, but um, the one side was an absolute Nazi saying how we needed to get rid of the banks and we needed to do all this. And we need to change society, get rid of the wealth. And it's like, 
yeah, we need to change society. His solution was to kill all the Jews. He's not an ally uh, when that happens. Um, I mean, it's revolutionary up front, but reactionary uh, sort of underneath and ultimately still serving the powers of the dominant class. It's a fascinating thing once you start breaking things down like that. All right. Uh, Mooncast, uh, from page 105, it says, uh, Delirium has something like two poles, racist and racial, paranoiac, segregative, and schizonomatic between the two ever so many subtle, uncertain shiftings where the unconscious itself oscillates between its reactionary charge and its revolutionary potential. Uh, the question is, do they mean to say that becoming reactionary, there is always an ongoing potential to become revolutionary, that those two are really close to each other? Um, I'm hesitant to say, hmm, I'm going to take a second before I respond. It's a really good question. Uh, I'm hesitant to say in a direct response to Remka uh, that they would say that they're really close to each other. Uh, they do say they're two poles. I would say that they're opposing and distance is not so much the question. Their use of the phrase uh, between the two ever so many subtle, uncertain shiftings where the unconscious itself oscillates between a reactionary charge and its revolutionary potential. The, the usage here is intentionally analog, that there isn't a way to really divide up, well, here's the 19 steps between reactionary and revolutionary. Instead, it's, it's a gradient. It's open. It's, it's on its way. It's a, always sort of this somewhere between the two. And they're very subtle, and the shiftings are odd. Um, it's not that they're close. It's that it's very difficult to tell them apart on their surface. Um, you know, their line, uh, even Schreber finds himself to be the great Mongol when he breaks through the Aryan segregation. I, I don't know if it's necessarily them saying that they're making a leap, that these things are super close, but that... Um, the poles, the poles may be incredibly close. They may be very far, but the, the, the shiftings between the two and the oscillations, uh, are basically constant, but it goes back to, I think, um, the line webcam parent, like really attached to it at the end of the, cause again, we can spend so long on the last two paragraphs. Um, but like they say very cleanly, uh, Reading a text is never a scholarly exercise in search of what is signified, even less a highly textual exercise in search of a signifier. Rather, it is a productive use of a literary machine, a montage of desiring machines. Uh, that line is not there because suddenly they want to talk about books. Uh, they want to talk about the very nature of how all of this sort of plays in, how these desiring machines play in, and that when you're searching for a meaning in a text, which, uh, or in search of a, a highly textual exercise in search of a signifier, suddenly uh, it's it's broken moment. It's a broken moment because you're trying to distill things down to a singular meaning. That last line, the exclamation, so it's, well, or the meditation on race in an essential relationship with madness. It's a wonderful way of saying it's about pulling out the revolutionary force from things rather than demanding they be easily classified and turned into representation, essentially. I, I, there's like a quote from Dulles in, in the uh, Alphabet series that he did that I think is quite synonymous here, where he says there are no philosophical concepts that don't have non-philosophical coordinates, ultimately. I highly suggest it's a uh, Deleuze ABCs it's, uh, on uh, YouTube. It's one hundred percent worth wa worth watching. And that's a, just a great line from it. Thank you. All right. Uh, any. Last questions or thoughts before I shut things down and move us out of this long, long, long reading. We finally get to finish 2.5 after three weeks, which is nice. 
And we get to really, the great part is the, the next section, which is uh, wonderful. It's a recapitulation of the three syntheses because we now get to resummarize everything and maybe uh, take a step beyond Oedipus because so far we've been uh, going through everything with an eye on Oedipus specifically. And now, is there a way for us to take that next step forward? Uh, the eyes of Nietzsche uh, throughout. Yeah, the next section is a bit of an overview. It's also a little bit of an easier read than the last few, so. Uh, but if there's no more questions, we'll give uh, Lumer a chance to finish typing. I think we will uh, begin to end the stream. Uh, and you guys are welcome to hang out, uh, say hi. Uh, chat a little bit, but I think we're going to go ahead and finish up today, so thank all of you for joining us. Uh, be watching uh, same time next week. We'll move into uh, 2.6.